Welcome to Dodger Stadium. It's the opener of a three-game series between the Cincinnati Reds and the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Reds coming in, winners in their last four straight. The Dodgers have taken two in a row. And let's look at the starting lineup first of all for Davey Johnson's Cincinnati Reds. In the leadoff spot, one of the oldest rookies in the majors just recently called up, Greg Tubbs. He'll be out in center field. Jeff Branson bats second at shortstop. And a Tal Morris. He's back. He's at first base hitting third. Kevin Mitchell, another one off the disabled list recently. In left field of the cleanup spot, Chris Sabo hurt earlier. He is batting fifth with Reggie Sanders hitting sixth out in the right field. Joe Oliver putting together impressive numbers behind the plate. Juan Samuel, the starting second baseman, and Tom Browning, the left-hander, out on the hill for the Reds. 25-year-old right-hander Ramon Martinez in his fifth season with the Dodgers. 8-6, 3.12, only 129 hits allowed in 144 innings. So he has shown good stuff. The walks are high. In fact, the Dodgers are 13th in the National League in walks allowed. Looking at the improved Dodger defense playing behind Ramon, well, Corey Snyder at third, Tim Wallach still Jose DL, Jose Offerman only one error in the last 27 games at short, Jody Reed only four errors all year long at second, and Eric Carlos at first. Eric Davis, the former red and left. Brett Butler, 205 straight games without an error in center. Raul Mondesi in right. Mike Piazza, the leading candidate for rookie of the year behind the plate. Mr. Tubbs steps in. We're ready to go. He has waited a long time for this opportunity. He will turn 31 on the 31st of this month. Greg Tubbs from Cookville, Tennessee. And we're underway at Dodger Stadium, the first one. Down and away for ball Start one. Greg Tubbs started his career in the Braves farm system. Stayed there until 1990 when he was traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates. And now... Finishing up his first year with the Cincinnati Reds organization. Better than 1,100 games in the minors. Patience finally paying it off. You never know. See, he's kind of a mini version of Kirby Puckett, and the Reds love his aggressiveness. He did not scare when he came up here. He's been waiting a long time for the chance. Last two years at the AAA level in Buffalo. Pittsburgh Pirates AAA affiliate the 2 1 gave it at two balls and two strikes Martinez fastball curve and change his brother Pedro pitches on the staff and his younger brother may even throw harder than Ramon they've had Pedro at 93 Ramon's been at 91 this year the 2 2 do it one more time I asked Tommy Lasorda, is Ramon Martinez all the way back? Because he had the elbow problems last year. They shut him down towards the end of last season. Tommy said he may not be all the way back from 1991. He's lost a little something off the fastball, but he's also gained an experience. He's become a much better pitcher. Yeah, the thing that's hurt him have been the base on balls. Going the other way, it's a line drive base hit. The right fielder, Raul Mondesi, throwing behind the runner. Heads up play. Tubbs is back to the back in time. He almost picked his first baseman, Eric Garros, off with that one. A perfect throw. They might have had Tubbs. Jose Cardinal, the first base coach, who says he has never seen such atrocious base running in his life by his team, the Cincinnati Reds, talking to Greg, saying, uh, come on, Greg, don't start off this game by getting a hit and then getting picked off rounding the base. Jose said recently in a column that he thinks his team may lead the league in stupidity on the bases. And the irony of that, I think, is the fact that the Cincinnati Reds under Lou Pinello I thought they were the singular best base running team in the National League the last few years. But some changes and some of the new guys coming in haven't run with great intelligence. Fastball over the outside edge to Jeff Ranson. He is filling in for the injured Barry Larkin at shortstop tonight. 282 coming in. He has 12 doubles, one home run. Second round draft choice of the Reds back in 88. Well wide, and it's even at a ball and a strike. Barry Larkin not in there tonight. Larkin with a cortisone shot and that damaged left thumb yesterday. And the Reds, according to Davey Johnson, are going to look at Larkin in two days. And if the thumb has not responded to the cortisone shot, they probably are going to shut him down for the year and maybe exploratory surgery on the left thumb. He hurt it in April. It's bothered him all year. He's gone to the post. He's never been DL. But the thumb has really bothered him all year long. Two balls and a strike. So Martinez has fallen behind the first two that he has faced this evening. And Dave alluded to the fact, 73 walks. There's Barry Larkin. See the left thumb taped. 
I don't think he would hit under any circumstances tonight. Davey might be able to use him as a pinch runner or if need be for defense because they're very thin in the infield. The Reds have been one of the most successful teams percentage wise on the bases this year and Davey Johnson had a very good reputation as the manager of the New York Mets. The Mets always had a very high success rate at right around 73 74 75 percent of their stolen base attempts. There goes the runner. The fastball swung on and missed. The throw to the wrong side of the bag. And Tubbs is on his way to the third. The throw by Butler offline. Boy, what a great pop-up slide by Greg Tubbs at second base. He hardly even hit the dirt and was up running again. If you go in with that pop-up slide where you just hit and jump up, and they appeal at second base, they said Tubbs was so fast in the second, they didn't think he touched the bag. But watch the slide at second and how quickly he gets back up. This is the pop up slide you go in and you're just right up and running. He never even broke stride and Butler was charging. But Tubbs all the way to third stolen base throwing air on Piazza and the Reds are in business here in the first. Second stolen base in the young major league career of 30 year old Greg Tubbs. Yes. I was going to say that's one of the things if you go in head first you can't get on your feet that fast. Pulled on one hop at Carroll's, looking the runner back at third, and Branson grounds into the first out of the contest. The umpiring crew tonight behind the plate. It's Wally Bell, Larry Vanover's at first base, Harry Wendelstedt, the crew chief at second base, and Randy Marsh over at third. You talk about that pop up slide, and I was watching Mel Thompson of the Philadelphia Phillies sliding very late. Similar manner, the pop up. So you, if you go ahead first, obviously, Dave, you don't have that advantage. Really, that's a slide that was developed about 25, 30 years ago. But prior to that, a lot of the old time players used to use the hook slide. That was tough to get on your feet too. You were fading away or fading into the base, trying to avoid the tag. But most base runners today feel if you go straight into that bag hard, it's the quickest way in. And most of the time, the umpires are going to call you out if the ball beats you, whether you've been able to hook around a, uh, a fielder or not. Al Morris hitting 310 coming in at the plate with a strike one count. Can he get the Reds to lead? Stayed upstairs, and it's a ball and a strike. Dodger infield playing games while Ramon started his stretch. The infield was playing deep, and then they came racing in as Ramon Martinez started his stretch just to try to confuse the base runner. Now they're playing halfway. Let's see if they'll charge further. Al Morris has been hot recently, but that is right after a 1 for 15 slump. He now comes in tonight with an eight game hitting streak. He said when he was in that slump, sometimes it's better off just not even going near the cage. The one and one. Two balls and a strike. Better than a 400 clip over the last eight for the native Munster, Indiana. Came over to the Reds from the New York Yankees. You might remember that deal for pitcher Tim Leary before the start of the 1990 season. The 2 1. Three balls and a strike, and he's behind on the count again. Some of the old timers might be grumbling at me out there saying the pop up slide's 25 to 30 years old. I must confess, I don't know how old it is, but I know the old timers used to do the hook slide. I don't know who the first guy responsible for that pop up slide. I know Bernie DeVivris, a great instructor in the Detroit organization, was teaching it well back in the late 50s and early 60s. Looked like the changeup from Martinez on 3 and 1. Not a bad pitch. Does have a base open, but the dangerous Kevin Mitchell behind. But obviously, Morris sitting all over fastball, and Ramon pulled the string. Kevin Mitchell in the on deck circle. Just coming off the disabled list as well after a hamstring injury. The three and two, and he got Morris on one that could have been out of the strike zone. The first strikeout for Martinez. Well, he set up that beautifully with the three one change and then breezed him away. And you can see Hal not too happy about it. Mitchell. Borderline pitch, probably a ball, no doubt about it. And Morris flailing away. So a lot of times a pitcher can win his ball game in the first inning. Reds had a man at third with nobody out. And he's still perched there with two outs. Ramon Martinez in his 22nd start of the season. His last start came on the 31st at Wrigley. Didn't figure in the decision, but Two run ball over eight plus innings. And the first is the fastball to Mitchell for strike one. There's someone who's been playing in pain all season long with that broken bone in his foot. 
He really has. He's had the broken bone in the foot. He's had a special shoe constructed for him. He's had hand injuries, hamstring injuries. But you know, one thing about Kevin, he is carrying some excess tonnage. And trust me, you're going to sustain more injuries when you're carrying a lot of weight. It puts a lot of pressure on the lower half of your body. Kevin's not as big as he was in spring training. But when he had his great year with the Giants in 1989, he weighed about 210 to 215 and considerably more right now. He was the National League MVP, as Dave alluded to in 89 with the San Francisco Giants. Fastball catching the outside corner of all in two strikes. And during that 89 season, 47 home runs to lead the league. Also knocked in 125 runs, also tops, and led the National League in slugging percentage. He's in the hole now as Martinez is the head of a hitter for the first time in the top of the first. Runner on third. Greg Tubbs started the inning with a line drive single to right field. Sold his second base, went to third on the throwing air by the catcher Mike Piazza. And he's there now with two away. And he got him on a high, hard one. Heat against power, and Martinez wins out at least on this occasion. No scores. The Dodgers get ready to hit for the first time. Tommy Lasorda's Los Angeles Dodgers coming tonight. Five games over the 500 mark. Winners of two straight. And let's look at the lineup card for the veteran manager here in Southern California. Leading things off as usual, the veteran up in center field and one of the best leadoff men still in baseball, Brett Butler. Followed by Jose Offerman, the shortstop. Then it's Eric Davis hitting third out in left field. Eric Carroll's in the cleanup spot once again, last year's rookie of the year. Hitting fifth, maybe this year's rookie of the year. Good chance to catcher Mike Piazza. Corey Snyder's at third base once again. Then it's Raul Mondesi, the newcomer in right field, batting seventh, hitting eighth. Second baseman Jody Reed and Ramon Martinez going for Los Angeles. Tom Browning, the left-handers, starts, and Brett Butler looks at strike one. Don't blink. You'll miss it. Tom Browning, who had a perfect game against these Dodgers in 1988, the quickest worker probably in the major leagues. Umpires are supposed to give two minutes in between each half inning. Tom tests that each time. The first two over. Uh, nothing in two coming to the center fielder. Down the line, but foul. Now, you were a player in an era, era, Dave, where there were a lot of quick pitchers in the late 60s, early 70s. Well, guys like Randy Jones, Jim Cott, Bob Gibson. I remember one time Randy Jones hooked one up with Cott at about an hour 29 in San Diego. That doesn't happen anymore. The impressive start for Tom Browning. The strikeout of Brett Butler. Looking at the defense playing behind Tom Browning tonight, Chris Sabo at third. Jeff Branson fills in for Barry Larkin at short. Juan Samuel at second and Hal Morris at first. Kevin Mitchell, Greg Tubbs, and Reggie Sanders. Sanders, an excellent arm and right. Joe Oliver having a big year behind the plate. And 33-year-old left-hander Tom Browning on the mound. As we look at Branson, who has been playing quite a bit of late, 18 of the last 21 games he started. They like him at second, but right now he has to play short with Larkin out. Brings up shortstop Jose Offerman. And the first one is wide for ball one. Offerman starting the night at 273. Solid line drive hitter. New career high with those 44 runs driven in. It's over the outside corner. It's a ball and a strike. He'll be followed by Eric Davis, the left fielder. Bases empty, one away. One and two. But while Browning is a quick worker, he's not been making quick work of the opposition this year. They have been hitting at a very lofty average in his 108 and a third inning so far. He has given up 152 hits. Outside, it's two and two. Batting average versus 336. That's the highest of any starter. Left-handers, 250. The right-handers are batting 336 against Berkeley. I'm sorry, 352. The bouncer for Hal Morris Browning covering. And quickly, there's two down. Of course, a lot of people aware of Tom being arrested last week with possession of marijuana in the car. But in the development today, his lawyer says that Tom Browning took a test the next day that showed absolutely no traces of marijuana in his system. And his lawyer basically was hinting that Browning was set up. So stay tuned for developments. It was kind of a uh, fait accompli. It appeared last week with a new twist in the marijuana story today. Third man of the batting order, Eric Davis, and to just tag that story, Dave also heard that three other people had access to that car earlier in the day. It had been serviced as well. 
Even at a ball and a strike, and Browning made news earlier this year when he was found sitting atop a building on Wavelet Avenue, waving to his Cincinnati Red teammates in the dugout at Wrigley Field as Davis fouls it away, one and two. And also was at odds early on with his general manager, Jim Bowden, about the fact that Tom has a clause in his contract that if he pitches 200 innings this year, his contract for next year automatically kicks in, and he accused Bowden of orchestrating the fact to get him out of the game earlier sometimes when he was struggling a little bit. They've since, I think, patched that up. They had a long talk last week. Browning had 200 plus innings in four straight seasons from 88 to 91. The tops of 250 and two thirds back in 88. Barely misses low and away. And it's even to Davis now at two and two. Well, Davey Johnson did not like Tom Browning on the roof on Wavelet Avenue. Slapped him with a five. And that's the one player that obviously could get away with it, a starting pitcher who wasn't scheduled to work that day anyway. Who's that guy on the right? Is this baseball tonight or what? Ray Knight. We'll be hearing from Ray a little baseball, bit later this evening. Baseball Ray Knight as opposed to tonight. Hot shot, and it's up the middle for a base hit. Out of the reach of the second baseman, Juan Samuel. So a two-out single for Eric Davis coming off his best month of the season so far. And he had 275 in July. I don't think you really want to throw Eric Davis change-ups up. His bat has slowed down a little bit, and I think you do a pretty good job of setting him up to have him be successful if you throw him change-ups, particularly in that area. Eric Karros is average down to 260 for last year's National League Rookie of the Year. As Davis draws a throw, very successful once again in the stolen base department. He's the all-time success leader in stolen base career attempts. 87% for Davis. Anybody over 300 attempts, he is the all-time leader. Had a string of 34 in a row stopped this year. Eric Pappas of the St. Louis Cardinals who had not thrown out a runner all year. I thought that was kind of ironic. And this was 0 for 14 and Davis had 34 straight. What are the odds? And then he threw him out for the final out of a very close game. So far this season he is 26 for 31. The 1 pulled into left field. Line drive single. Back to back base hits for Davis and now Caros. So the Dodgers with an opportunity with two away in the bottom of the first and now two aboard. Number 31, catcher. And their best hitter this year in these situations. Catcher Mike Piazza coming up. Other scores, you can keep up with the finals. Games in progress around the majors. So two down. Piazza in these situations hitting 391 with men in scoring position and two away. Overall with men in scoring position a lofty 340 average for the leading candidate for National League Rookie of the Year. No score two away bottom of the first at Dodger Stadium. It looked like it was going to be an easy inning for Browning. The 0-1. The experience of Browning paid off there. Yeah, the screwball. But the one interesting thing about Piazza, he's had several swings like that this year. But once he gets two strikes on him, he starts thinking the other way. And you don't fool him as badly. Up until two strikes, he's usually swinging for the long one. He's in an 0 2 hole. And he sends a fly ball in the direction of the center fielder, Greg Tubbs. And that's the final out of the inning as the Dodgers can't capitalize on the back to back base hit. So they strand a couple. They finished 18 games over the 500 mark in 1992 and eight games out of first place in the Western Division. But Tony Perez was in that spot you're looking at right now for the first 44. Then Davey Johnson took over. And things just haven't panned out all the way around this year for the Reds. Well, they haven't. They got off to their worst start in 35 years at 2 and 9. Perez only got 44 in, and then the injuries just absolutely killed them. They've had 12 guys in the disabled list, and it's really been a miserable year for the Cincinnati Reds overall. They're trying to regroup and finish strongly. Chris Sable certainly has been swinging the bat well of late. And another one that was on the disabled list. He had a ruptured disc in his back, came off the disabled list on June 15th, and has been very successful ever since. 
And again, you see the 12 players, and one of them has not been Larkin, but he could be headed that way. Just going to be to see how he responds from the cortisone shot yesterday. This is the second consecutive season that Sabo has been bothered by injuries. Last year it was that foot and ankle problem. But he has improved offensively with each month. At 243 in May, then 308 in June, and up to 337 in the month of July. So the stroke is back for Chris Sabo. He leads the Reds and runs batted in with 63. The two and one. Even at two balls and two strikes. Sabo's really changed his approach to hitting the last couple of years. He used to be right on top of the plate and really pulling everything. Now he's well off the plate, striding in. He's still a pull hitter, but he's a change. He's changed his approach. Good number of pitches thrown by Ramon Martinez in the first inning. Again, another three ball count. There you see the average rising dramatically this season for Chris Sabo. And he rips it into left. Eric Davis coming on for the first out of the second. Chris Sabo hits as many vicious line drives to the left side of the diamond as anybody in baseball. He got that one up a tad. And Eric Davis with that ball hooking a little bit with a top hand. Sabo got in there. The ball almost got past Eric. You see him coming. Looks like he's going to get it easy. And then the ball really starts to hook on him. But he is a terrific defensive left fielder. So with one down, as Sabo, one of those atom balls, getting it right on the button, but at someone. Now it's Reggie Sanders, the right fielder, backing up from ball one. The young man that the Reds, manager Davey Johnson, said just recently there are only two untouchables as far as I am concerned on this team, Barry Larkin and Reggie Sanders. 266 so far this season. And he takes it deep to left field. Davis going back and only watch. It's gone to the Reds. Lead it one to nothing. And the Reds with a new team leader in home runs. That is the 16th for Sanders. Now the Reds think he has a chance to be a 30-30 man. He also has 17 stolen bases. And he had a breaking ball from Ramon Martinez. He just went down and raked it and pulled it to left field. Catcher, Joe Oliver. It's a curveball from Martinez. Outer half, but Reggie just went out and just pulled it and got great wood to it and lost it. The fastball down the middle to Joe Oliver for strike one. So that is now the 13th home run allowed by Ramon Martinez. That's tops among the Dodgers starters. Joe Oliver tried to bunt his way aboard. How often do you see a catcher do that? Out number two. Well, Joe may rethink <laughs> it. He had Corey Snyder playing very deep. He wanted to get the ball down the third baseline, but dumped it right out in front of the plate. Easy play for Piazza. Second baseman, Juan Samuel. Two away, base is empty. And now it's the red second baseman. His 26th start at second, only his 27th of the season. Former Dodger, Juan Samuel. Juan went to Kansas City last year after starting the season with the Dodgers. Career bat began in the Phillies organization, and he goes after the breaking ball and lines it into left for a two out single. Joel, I know you need all your pitches when you're going to pitch at the major league level, but we had Ramon Martinez at a season high 95 miles an hour on the strikeout of Kevin Mitchell in the first inning. And that ended the inning and he's gotten burned twice on breaking balls here the curveball to Reggie Sanders and now a breaking ball to Sam well. So you may see Piazza going back to that number one a little more. His curveball is just kind of rolling there's not any snap to it tonight at all. Ramona has not been able to pick up a victory. Since four starts ago on the 15th of July. Beating the Montreal Expos 3 2. And now pitcher Tom Browning taking the fastball for strike one. Has a home run this year among his six hits. Good speed on the bases in Samwell. But the last thing they want to do is see Samwell thrown out, the pitcher leading off the next inning. And it's a ball and a strike. So 
one to nothing Cincinnati lead. A run on three hits. And Browning bloops a broken bat single into left field. So two out singles now for Samuel and Browning. Number 51, Greg Tubbs. Browning just kind of soft serves this one out in the left field, tailing fastball, and Browning hits it where he should to left field. So Roman Martinez has already seen the entire Reds order. And we're still in the second inning. His only start against Cincinnati this year came way back on May 17th. Six and a third, giving up four runs on 12 hits. And Ramon has not had a lot of luck against the Cincinnati Reds lifetime. He is four and five with a 5.56 earned run average. The bouncer, and it's speared by Martinez. There's the final out in the second, but the Reds do take the lead by way of that young man from Florence, South Carolina, Reggie Sanders, 16th home run of the year, putting Cincinnati up on top by one. All right, Chris Corey Snyder leading things off for the Dodgers in the bottom of the second with Los Angeles trailing by a run. It'll be Snyder, Raul Mondesi, and Jody Reed. Finally, Corey Snyder slowing down. Average down to 267 after hitting better than 300 in May and better than 300 in June. Corey hit barely 200 in the month of July. Well, Corey wants to prove that he's still an everyday player. And you can see his numbers have not been that good since the break. This ball's hit well. Lines it into right. Diving attempt. Did Sanders come up with it? No, he trapped it. And Snyder has a leadoff single. Great effort, though, by Reggie Sanders. Well, Snyder taking Browning the other way. That's the best way to try to hit him. If you try to pull him, you're going to play a lot of pepper with the shortstop. Great effort by Sanders. Not quite there. Well, if you can't get your glove on it, can't keep it in there. Would have been an interesting call by the umpire, second base umpire. Harry Wendelstadt went out to make the call, but the ball never hit the glove, so that was a pretty easy one. Now a young man that was just called up about three weeks ago for the Los Angeles Dodgers, Raul Mondesi. He is out in right field taking over for Corey Snyder. Well, Snyder has moved into the infield once again to third base. Mondesi last year was so upset that he was not called up. The Dodgers sent him down to double A at one point. And he pops one up into shallow right center. Greg Tubbs calling for it. And that's the first out. And Snyder will move back to first. It'll be an interesting evening for Mondesi from the standpoint Tim Wallach is fairly close to coming off the DL. In fact, he was going to be examined today. And Mondesi is the odds on favorite to go down when Wallach comes back. But, you know, a guy who. Can come up with a three for four night with a homer or something like that sometimes can change people's mind. Jody Reed, the Dodgers second baseman batting for the first time this evening with one away, bottom of the second, one to nothing Reds. And it's over the outside corner for strike one. Just recently, Jody Reed and Jose Offerman getting into it. Close to a confrontation of the dugout. They had words in the field. Reed was waiting for the throw from left fielder Mitch Webster. Didn't call for Offerman to cut the ball off. Offerman did, though, and that's when everything started. They were both brought into the manager's office following the game time of the Sorta. Long talk with the skipper, and then fined the next day for the two players. Into the pocketbooks. Corey Snyder. Going to throw for at first base. Snyder, not an out and out steel guy, but Jody Reed, one of the best hit and run men in baseball. And Tommy Lasorda is a guy who likes to utilize the hit and run. Jody looks down at Joe Malfitano again. It could be Tommy saw all that attention, may have taken it off. Trying to go the other way. It's an 0 2 count. Now to Reed. Tommy's been playing very aggressive baseball all season long. 
Well, he doesn't have a team that's going to hit a lot of home runs. I mean, Piazza's given them some power increase this year. They only hit 72 last year, have 80 this year, but they're still not amongst the power elite in the National League. So Tommy will activate things on the base pass. In the dirt, a ball in two strikes. And this is not exactly a hitter's park either. No, not by any stretch of the imagination. It's very fair to hit a home run here. You don't get any cheapies at Dodger Stadium. Generally, the air is fairly heavy here. And the Dodger pitchers have allowed the fewest home runs once again this year, only 67 in the league. Even at two and two. The pitcher coming up next, Ramon Martinez. Two teams very close in the Western Division. Jody looking at Amalfitano again to see if Browning might be moving. He's not. And Reed going into right center. The ball bending towards the right field of the Reggie Sanders for the second out here. The second is we head back to Chris Myers. Chris. All right, thanks, Joe. Budweiser to Toronto in a tie game. Bottom of the ninth, John Olerud off Jesse Orozco on the little tapper. He is one for five, currently batting 391, and they do go to extra innings. The Blue Jays and the Brewers, you can catch Toronto, see how big their lead is in first in the AL East, and Olerud's chase of 400 on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Chris, the pitcher Ramon Martinez, first ball swinging, fouls it away for strike one. I've never seen Ramon personally walk up there right handed. He's always been a left handed hitter, but maybe because Browning throws left handed, he's not going to expose that front arm to a pitcher from that side. To Hopper for the second baseman, the force play. And the side is retired, so they can't do a thing after the leadoff single from Corey Snyder, and the Reds continue to lead it by a run. ESPN's presentation of Major League Baseball is brought to you by Bud Light. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down, make it a Bud Light. And by Pizza Hut, who reminds you that anytime's a great time to stop and smell the pizza. interesting year to say the least for the Cincinnati Reds and right now in the opener of the three game set they have a one to nothing lead over the Los Angeles Dodgers top of the third inning Joel Myers along with Dave Campbell and the two three and four hitters coming up first ball swinging Branson for the second baseman Martinez covers and barely in time to get Branson at first see Jose Cardinal talking to the first base umpire it was close Jeff Branson really moving well down the line he had a serious knee injury last year tore the anterior cruciate ligament and he was hit by Eric Young of the Dodgers on a slide. But you see him with good mobility. And Martinez goes up. Does he get it down in time? Yes, he does. Good call by the first base umpire, Larry Vanover. But Branson is moving well, and that's good. In fact, the doctor, Dr. Andrews down in Birmingham, says Branson returned from that anterior cruciate ligament faster than any athlete he's ever seen. They thought maybe all-star game this year. He was ready for spring training. Well conditioned athlete making it back rapidly. Hal Morris, another one who's been bothered by injuries for the Cincinnati Reds this year. In fact, he missed the first two months of the season. So the shoulder separation did not come back till the first week of June. Hal's feistiness caught up with him. He went after Jose Mesa and they brawled, and Morris came out of it with a separated shoulder or a collarbone. Fastball overthrown, and now 3 0. Last year, he got into it with Gary Carter, then of the Montreal Expo. So, Hal, take it easy, pal. Much better, better hitter with the bases empty. Fastball down the middle. Morris has really had problems, though, with men in scoring position. Not even hitting close to 200 this year. In those situations, three and one count with one away. Going the other way, it's fouled away, and it's three and two. Even though Morris does move his feet in the box while he's hitting, and a lot of batting coaches like to preach staying still, he's a lot more still than he used to be. We talked to Ray Knight about that, who is the batting coach, and he says, we've concentrated. He's still got a little bit of rhythm going, but he doesn't quite walk all over the batter's box like he used to. The payoff pitch, the off-speed delivery on three and two, and Martinez will do it himself. Opportunity to check in with Chris once again. All right, Joel Budweiser takes us to Texas fifth inning here. Chris Bassiano, Rafael Palmero, adding to his career high home run total in one season is 29. 10 homers in his last 13 games. Texas wins 5 3. 
The White Sox lose to the Angels. The Royals are losing in the ninth to Oakland. So the Rangers are three and a half games behind now in the AL West. Let's go back to Joel and Dave. All right, Chris. Two away, base is empty. And a left fielder, Kevin Mitchell, who struck out for the final out of the first inning, grounds the ball to the shortstop, Jose Offerman, who gets the big hop. And the best inning so far for right-hander Ramon Martinez. He sets them down in order as we go to the last of the third. The Reds on top by one. The exceptional tennis the next two weeks. You saw the Thriftway ATP Championship coming up starting on Monday on ESPN. And then it's the last tune-up before the U.S. Open. The Volvo Championship in New Haven, Connecticut. Seven straight days of outstanding tennis. So two weeks in a row, the very best in the world on ESPN and the hard courts. Brett Butler leads it off. First ball swinging and, as usual, loves to go the other way. His first hit of the night. Now, Brett had four hits yesterday at the Astrodome. Was only the home run shy of the cycle, but that's pretty much norm for Brett. He's tied for the National League lead in triples, but has trouble hitting it over the fence. But, boy, what a terrific job of hitting. He leads the Dodgers in hits and walks. On base percentage right up there as usual. No signs of showing slowing down by this Dodger leadoff hitter at age 36. And Jose Offerman advance the tying run standing over at first base now. Big difference between home and road. Trying to bunt for the base hit. Sabo the barehand attempt not in time. I think they must have said that Morris came off the bag, and I think David Johnson is going to go out and have a chat with Larry Vanover. Morris thought he stayed on, and David Johnson did too, so he's going, what does the guy have to do? the league and sacrifice bunts with 14 but bunny for a base hit here looks to me like out but not according to the first base umpire we didn't have the perfect angle to make sure Morris's foot was on there but it looked pretty close so the Dodgers have the first two reads safely Butler and Offerman and it's strike one to Eric Davis he had a base hit his first time up a line drive single to center a couple of hits for the Dodgers in the first another in the second and now two more off Browning here in the third five already good stop by Joe Oliver Davis has not treated his former mates too well 10 hits 24 at bats against the Reds since he has left Cincinnati that's over a 400 average. Most activity for Eric Davis over the last three years. His 43 RBI, the best he's had since 1990. And the off speed delivery, it's one and two. I hear you did it politically correct, RBI. That is the correct term, but I noticed a couple of columnists said, Why do announcers say RBIs? Because it only became politically correct to say RBI about two or three years ago. And I've been around too long to change. <laughs> That's why. RBI doesn't sound right to me. RBIs, yes, even though it's not correct. And if you really want to worry about correctness, it isn't San Diego or San Francisco. It's San Francisco and San Diego, if you really want to be correct about it. I am glad you're here to keep us in line. A line drive. Browning has it. The double play. Good thing Offerman was a learner. That had triple play written all over it. Jose didn't stray too far off first. Butler had no chance at second. Browning, an excellent fielding pitcher. And Eric Davis hits a rocket back through the middle. But look how Browning finishes off squared up the home plate. Some pitchers falling off to the side. Just flicks the glove out. He knows what to do with it on loads to second. And Samuel looks at first, but Offerman got back very quickly. No chance for the triple play. So Browning very fortunate now to be dealing to Eric Karos with two down and only a runner over at first Jose Offerman. Karos also had a base hit his first time up there. Offerman another one with a very good stolen base ratio last year for the Los Angeles Dodgers so far this year. 
21 steals and 29 attempts. He's not in the move. But it's fouled away for strike one. When you come to Dodger Stadium, you don't see too many triple plays. And since the Dodgers have come west, they have never turned one, not home nor away. The last time the Los Angeles Dodgers turned a triple play, and they were the Brooklyn Dodgers. It was 1949. Jackie Robinson and Gil Hodges were involved in it with Gene Hermansky. So the Dodgers, we're not talking about an assisted triple play. We're just talking about a triple play that's gone well over 40 years since their last triple play. Even at a ball and a strike to the Dodgers cleanup hitter, their first baseman, Eric Garros. When you put that in the context of the Minnesota Twins, one night turning two in one game against the Boston Red Sox, it even seems more astounding. Pitch out, but Offerman's not on the move. Two balls and a strike. Piazza in the on deck circle. So two power hitters in a row for the Dodgers, although Eric Garros. Slumping recently, not hitting the way he did during his rookie season. It's going to be tough for him to match his totals that he put together last year as he comes in tonight with 12 home runs and 46 runs driven in. The snap throw, Offerman back just in time. The 2 1, make it three balls and a strike, and almost thrown away by Joe Oliver. An adventure time down at first base. Jose may have injured himself lunging back to the bag. Yeah, he jammed his foot. Probably a little temporary stun. Oliver saw Jose a little bit off the bag, so he snapped the throw down, but Morris had to come out and make a good play. And Bill Bueller, the Dodger trainer, is going to go out and have a talk with his shortstop. Little did Joe Oliver know that the snap throw may take Offerman out of the game. See Offerman lunging for the bag and then the foot slips off and turns the ankle over a little bit. Mm. Easy night to stay warm as Tom Browning takes some warm up tosses while they look at Jose Offerman. Temperature just about 80 degrees at game time. Unusually high humidity for Southern California. And a crowd in the neighborhood of about 35,000 on hand at Dodger Stadium. So Caro's back in with a three and one count. The Reds on top by a run. And Caro sends it deep to left center field. Did he get under it too much? Yes. As Tubbs is center fielder just shy of the track as it's the final out of the inning. So the Dodgers strand another. They have left four on over the first three and are down by a run. Games behind the Phillies in the National League's Eastern Division, so they couldn't hang on to that 4-3 advantage. And when they've been able to get to Lee Smith, it's been the long ball this year. So the Cubs do it once again to the right-hander, and Chris Sabo takes the fastball over the outside corner to start the fourth for strike one. Sabo hit the ball hard his first time up there. On a full count delivery, lined it. Right at the left fielder Eric Davis. Even at a ball and a strike. He's hit Martinez well in the past. Three home runs in those nine hits. And he pops this one up on the infield. The third baseman coming over. Now will be Eric Karros, the first baseman, as they converge on the mound. That is out number one. Well, we'd certainly like to pass along heartiest congratulations to our normal Friday night producer who's not with us tonight. Yes, Jay yes. Cutlow and his wife Diana and the birth of their young daughter Rebecca born Wednesday night. Mom and Rebecca are doing great. Jay as usual is a nervous wreck. And as we know Jay Cutlow has enough lines and bags under his eyes already. Can you imagine <laughs> with a newborn now the cutter? <laughs> <laughs> Zippy. A lot of sleep for him in the future. Reggie Sanders looking at it low for ball one. His 16th home run of the season. A career best in that department. The difference in this contest is the Reds lead it one to nothing. Ball and a strike. Ramon Martinez looking for his first win in over three weeks. 
He doesn't have a decision this year against the Cincinnati Reds in his second start of the season against the Reds. Two balls and a strike. Sanders is definitely the complete package. And as Dave mentioned, the type of player that's continuing to mature to the point where he easily could be a 30-30 man. 30 home runs, 30 steals. As it's even a two and two. Also has the fine throwing arm, kind of an unorthodox throwing style, but a powerful arm. The Reds try to get it done tonight without three of the regulars in the lineup. Bobby Kelly, Barry Larkin. And also Bip Roberts as Sanders becomes the third strikeout victim for Martinez. And he went to the hard one. Well, when you have the 90 plus mile an hour fastball you can get away with a location here now this is right down the heart of the plate but when you have the extra gas with some hop on the fastball you can see Sanders is a bit tardy if that ball is 85 miles an hour plug your ears catcher Joe Oliver tried to bunt his way aboard his first at bat unsuccessfully he's 0 for 1 and it's ball one two way bases empty Martinez now has set down six in a row as it's two and zero oh. in a year where the Reds have just been beset by injury after injury. You would think normally one of the first guys to go down is your catcher, but not so. Oliver's played in 85 percent of the games. He has been a workhorse. He also has 60 RBIs, a career high. So he's been one of the pleasant surprises for the Reds this year. When Martinez falls behind, look for the fastball, and it's 2 and 1. Although on a couple of occasions we have seen the changeup for Martinez, a one to nothing Reds lead. It does that a lot more to left-handed batters than right-handed. Came in on the right-handed hitter, two and two. And Joe Oliver has been plenty hot in the power department over the last few days. He had five RBI yesterday. He had driven in 12 runs over the last five games. The 2-2. Two -two. And a fly ball into shallow center field for Brett Butler. That's the final out of the fourth. As Martinez is now settled down and retired seven in a row. We go to the last of the fourth with the Reds still leading the Dodgers. And New York right now. Tom Browning starts it off to Piazza high and tight for ball one. Well, the Jays relief face, Dwayne Ward, has been reported, has a little bit of bicep tendonitis. That's not good for Toronto fans. High again to an L. Browning and Rio now the veterans on this pitching staff is the deal they talked about so often for Cincinnati. It's finally culminated on the 31st of July with Tim Belcher going to the Chicago White Sox for Triple A pitcher John Ruffin and Double A closer Jeff Pierce as it's fouled off to the right side. Two balls and a strike. Well, Johnny Ruffin is certainly a guy that has a talented arm. Jack McKeon, who does a lot of advanced work and scouting for the Cincinnati Reds, says, I don't take this wrong, but he says, in some ways, he reminds me of a young Dwight Gooden. So that's pretty good praise indeed. Of course, he's not the pitcher Gooden is yet. Piazza flying out to the right fielder, who's almost in center field, Reggie Sanders, for the first out of the fourth. Now we're just talking about those Brewers and Blue Jays in the 11th, and it's Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN. The final game of the series between those two teams at Sky Dome. Ricky Henderson and John Olerud leading the Blue Jays, and the run-scoring leaders coming in today. Well, four of the top six wearing Blue Jay uniforms. Monitor, White, Alomar, and Henderson. That's all 8 o'clock Eastern on ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Corey Snyder. He had a base hit his first time up there. And he's in an 0-2 hole. Browning coming off knee surgery from a year ago. Knocked him out the last half of the year. Apparently has not shown any signs of problems with that, although you certainly can see the brace on the left leg after the cruciate ligament. And Branson both wearing braces. Fouled off. It remains 0-2. And we were just talking about Tim Belcher. A rough outing for Belcher last night in his first start as a new member of the Chicago White Sox pitching staff, losing that contest 7-1 to the Texas Rangers. Well, Tim really did not pitch terribly well going down the stretch before that trade. He got some wins, but the ERA was up quite a bit. But he has a great record in September and October in his career. Plus, he's 3-0 in postseason. And I think that's one of the things Ron Schuler was looking at. 
Belcher says, hey, I'm kind of a streaky pitcher and I'm not in a good one right now, but he can turn it around too. The one two Snyder, the one hopper at the second baseman, bobbled by Sam Wellen. That'll be enough time for Snyder to reach safely. It'll be an error on the second baseman, the first error of the contest on the Reds. Well, this was kind of an eat tie ground ball, the players called it. You can tell about the time it gets about 10 feet from you, it's going to eat you alive, and you just kind of hope that you can knock it down and keep it in front of you. A real grass cutter, and Sam Well just took it in the bread basket, knocked it down, but it went too far away from him to make a play. That's a polite way of putting it. Yeah. Well, at least Sammy. <laughs> Here's the he had the protective cup on anyway. <laughs> so the tying run is aboard for the Dodgers with one away in the bottom of the fourth. And the rookie who just came up from Albuquerque three weeks ago, Raul Mondesi, he fly it out. Shallow center field his first time up there. He is only 22 years old. Tommy the sort of told me before tonight's game, raw but has all the tools to be an exceptional player in this league. He sends a towering fly ball to the left center. Kevin Mitchell moving over, but Tubbs calls him off. And the center fielder squeezes it for the second out. Joe, one of the things that the Cincinnati Reds thought they had done in the offseason was shore up their pitching staff to compete with the Atlanta Braves, getting guys like Riho and Browning to go with Belcher, and of course, John Smiley, their acquisition. But it really hasn't worked out that way. You see the Red starters only 29 and 27. The Braves, pretty much as norm. The surprise has been the Giants. Their pitching staff, their st big four, 45 and 15. There was really nothing from last year to indicate they could turn it around that way. But hey, that's one of the fascinating things about baseball. You can plan and plan, but you still got to play 162. And a lot of guys in that San Francisco team are having great years. Jody Reed backs up from ball one. And overall, the Reds start the night eighth in the National League in pitching with a 4.05 earned run average. Jody Reed lined out to the right fielder. His first at bat. Slices it foul. It's a ball and a strike. Yeah, the offseason wags kind of thought, yeah, Atlanta has that big five with Pete Smith, but the Reds, when they picked up Smiley, they thought they had four guys with running records that can compete, and everybody thought Houston with Swindell and Drabeck had certainly upgraded their pitching. Drabeck has struggled to get wins. He hasn't pitched terribly, but hadn't had too much support. And Swindell struggled quite a bit of the year. And so. after that loss to the Dodgers just a couple of nights ago, Dave, now Drabeck is 7 and 13. Yeah. Well, there's always two sides to every story. I mean, Doug doesn't make excuses, but the Astros have gotten him 21 runs in his 13 losses. So he hasn't had a tremendous amount of run support. The ERA is still around 3 6 or 3 7, very respectable. The Reds 37 and 30 since Davy Johnson took over. They were 20 and 24 when Tony Perez was dismissed. One and two count on Reed, two away. Snyder aboard by way of the air, and Reed comes through with two away. The base hit to right. So on a one and two pitch. You talked about it before with an off-speed pitcher like Tom Browning. Take what he gives you and go the other way. Well, you really have to. I mean, once Tom Browning gets ahead of you, you kind of got to forget about going long ball and take the ball that's going to be tailing away from you. That way you protect against the screwball or changeup, whatever you want to call it, of Browning's and the fastball away. And Tom doesn't really have enough fastball to strike you out inside. You still can foul it off. Ramon Martinez. Fouls it off to the right side. And talking to our veteran Dodger watcher, our spotter tonight, Dennis Munition, I asked him if he had ever seen Ramon bat right handed in his career. He said no. So this is the second time, as far as we know, that Ramon has walked up there right handed. Normally a left handed batter, but of course that front arm would be exposed. He may have some kind of minor injury that keeps him from swinging the bat left handed that we're not aware of. The 0 and 1. Bouncer for the second baseman, the force play. And after giving up another base hit, the Dodgers strand a couple of more as he gets out of another jam. Welcome back once again to Dodger Stadium. Joel Myers along with Dave Campbell. We go to the fifth inning. Not exactly an artistic effort, but Browning continually working out of jams. Well, he's been ahead of 14 out of the 18 hitters. He hasn't walked anybody, which is very much a Tom Browning game. Gives up a lot of hits, but when he has to get out, when he's going to win, 
he gets those key outs. Uh, a couple of times he's had Ramon at the plate with two guys on. That helps because he hadn't swung very good. The line drive helped as well where he turned a double play on a hard hit ball off the bat of Eric Davis. And as Dave mentioned, he has not hurt himself by way of the walk. In fact, Browning now has gone 28 straight innings without issuing a free pass. So to the top of the fifth in Southern California, one to nothing lead for the Reds over the Dodgers. The Dodgers have out hit the Reds six to four. And leading things off for Cincinnati, the eighth man in the batting order, second baseman Juan Samuel. Trying to put his way up. Gordon Piazza diving. There's the first out. Well, there's your defensive play of the game. Mike Piazza came out from behind home play quickly, made the all-out lunge, and comes up with a gem. We'll see Piazza gets the mask off, recognizes the ball, gets a great break. Nice play. Saw a similar one last night on Sports Center from the Chicago White Sox catcher, Mike Lavalier. Spanky. The only problem with it is Spanky's helmet flew off and we learned a secret. <laughs> yeah, just kidding, Mike. I know all about that kind of player. Yeah, Lavalier is a good guy. <laughs> He will, he will he will eat me up just mildly next time I see him. I guess what we we're saying is maybe Mike should call the president of the hair club for men is that. <laughs> but he does he wants to be more than just a client. <laughs> he wants to be the president. One away faces empty the one and one to Brownie. Going down the line and left Davis moving over it'll drop in front for a base hit. Second hit of the night to left field for Tom Browning. Well, we found out Oral Hershiser is not the only good hitting pitcher in the ballpark. Oral's hitting over 400 this year, but Browning two for two tonight and has taken Ramon's outside offerings the other way. Eric was playing him over that way, but he just placed it almost right on the line, about four feet fair. It brings up 30 year old rookie. Greg Tubbs. He had a base hit in the stolen base, his first at bat. Bounced back of the pitcher his second time up there and takes strike one. Yeah, great story on Tubbs, the hitter. When he was 13 years old, he took a trip from Tennessee up to Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. And he said, you know what? I'm going to play in that stadium someday. And at age 31, he finally made it. Sharply hit up the middle. Offerman the flip to Reed, who bare hands for the out. Nice play all the way around by both Offerman and Reed. Now, Jose has a definite flair for the exciting play. His problems in the past have been on the routine. There's no question about his foot speed getting to baseballs, his range his strength of throwing arm it's been the consistency factor but only one error his last 27 games he probably might not have been able to throw out tubs at first base but with Browning running from first he gets the force and Jody Reed knows he's got no chance for the double play he just secures the out at second so it brings up shortstop Jeff Branson stolen base situation possibly here for the Cincinnati Reds Tubbs already has one tonight he went all the way to third on the throwing air by Piazza. And it's strike one. See if the Dodgers might pitch out. They have a strike to play with. They're ahead 0-1. They say Tubbs is pretty aggressive. Doesn't wait around too long. All the way. Nothing in two. Branson, a gold medal winner. U.S. Olympic baseball team in the Summer Games of 1988, Seoul, South Korea. He had a good deal of success against the Dodgers last year. His first season of the majors, when he hit better than 400 off Los Angeles pitching and 20 at bats. It's an 0-2 count to the hitter. Good speed on the bases. Gapper could easily produce another run for the Reds. They lead the Dodgers by one.
Martinez has certainly settled down after the first couple of innings. Pulled right at Eric Caros. A hard hit ball, but right at the first baseman for the final out of the fifth. So a couple of breaks for Martinez that time. We've seen it work for Browning already tonight, and we go to the last of the fifth with everything staying the same. Toronto Blue Jays trailing 10-8 have now tied the Milwaukee Brewers in the bottom of the 11th at 10. We're going to take you there live as the Blue Jays are threatening to break it open. John Olerud. Ball game is over. Blue Jays win 11-10. the Toronto Blue Jays and it is a horrifying loss for the Milwaukee Brewers. Well it was a wild 11th inning because Toronto trailed 10-8 in the bottom of the 11th. Ricky Henderson tripled in pinch runner William Cunate for one run and then Ricky scored on a wild pitch by Doug Henry to tie the game at 10. You saw after Devon White had tripled John Olerud only his second hit of the game driving in the game winner for the Blue Jays who will pick up ground on the Yankees they lost at Minnesota 4-3 also on the Red Sox who lost at Detroit 5-1 the Orioles who were three games out remain there they defeated the Cleveland Indians by the score of 8-1 again in extra innings at 11 the Blue Jays winners over the Milwaukee Brewers we return you now to Los Angeles the Dodgers and the Reds with Joel Myers and Dave Campbell and Chris there's one away now in the bottom of the fifth inning is Brett Butler Started it off with a fly ball to the left fielder, Kevin Mitchell. It brings up Jose Offerman. Reached safely with a bun signal his last time up there. And it's ball one. He'll be followed by Eric Davis. A one to nothing lead for Tom Browning and the Reds. And it's a pop-up behind the bag. Shallow center for Tubbs. Two away. Well, with that game just ending, Toronto battling back. A two-run deficit, trailing 10-8 on their way to the bottom Davis. of the 11th inning. They win it by a run. They stay two on top of Boston. The same over the Yankees. And with the Orioles winning tonight, they stay only three lengths off the lead held by the Toronto Blue Jays. As tight as ever in the East, despite the fact that they did gain a game on both the Yankees and the Red Sox. Huge win for the Jays, especially in the manner they did it. Ricky Henderson paying dividends and over getting the key hit. Milwaukee really struggling right now. Got a feeling, Dave, as Eric Davis robbed his last time up there. He's got a base hit. Should have two, though. A line drive was speared his last time up there by Browning. Turned into a double play and got Browning out of a third inning jam. Got a feeling the East or the West are still going to go down to the wire in the American League. It's high. And it's three and one. Well, it looked like Texas was starting to slide until that fight that seemed to give them a lift. They won three out of four against the White Sox and won tonight. So the Rangers anything but dead. White Sox were playing the Angels last we saw. It was 6-3. They haven't had an update on that. It was 6-3 Angels. This is only the second three ball count issued tonight by Tom Browning. He has now gone through 28 and two-thirds innings without issuing a walk. And he's run it full to Eric Davis. Bases empty, two away. Major League record, 84 and a third by Bill Fisher. National League record by Randy Jones and Christy Matthewson at 68 and two thirds. And the ball gets away from Tubbs, who misplayed the line drive. It looked like Davis was going to have his third hard hit ball of the night, but only one for three after it. I think that was one of those knuckle balls, and Tubbs just got befuddled on it. Sometimes you hit a ball so square on the bat, you take the spin off, and it really knuckles out there. You can see Tubbs is having a little trouble picking it up, and then it hits the blade of his glove. Let's we'll see how they score it. They've scored it in an error on Tubbs, and tough luck for Eric Davis, but the correct call. The tying run in scoring position for the Dodgers' first baseman, Eric Karros. He's 0 for 2 or make it 1 for 2. Base hit the left, light out deep to center. His last time up there. And overmatched on the breaking ball for strike one. He took a day off Wednesday. Not by choice, but because he was slumping. And then he comes back yesterday. 
with a couple of hits, including a home run in the Dodgers' victory over the Houston Astros. Wilson throws him a one for 20, so Tommy did give him a day off and then bounced back. Drove in three, scored two for the Dodgers last night, so in some respects, Carroll's responsible for all five runs. Davis, a great base dealer, a third, but with two outs, really not a time to go unless you absolutely have it in your hip pocket. Ball with a strike now to Carroll's. Browning really upset after that last delivery. Browning, 13 and 10, a lifetime against Los Angeles. He's already beaten the Dodgers once this year, 8 4 on the 19th of June at Riverfront Stadium, working six innings. The one and one to Carroll's. Popped up. The second baseman, Sam Well, ranging back. Called off by the right fielder, Sanders. And the Dodgers can't capitalize on the air by the center fielder. So after five, Browning dealing and a shutout so far. Pitchers duel so far, despite the fact we've seen some hard hit balls from both teams. They've combined for 11 hits, but Browning and Martinez have been able to work out of a number of jams. And it's a one to nothing Reds lead with Hal Morris starting it off in the sixth inning. High and wide for ball one. Who can forget what happened to Hal Morris in the on-deck circle trying to beat out Terry Pendleton for the National League batting title back in 1991. And finishing only one 1,000 of a point behind Pendleton. Who won the title at 319. Well, he had to go four for four. He went three for three against Andy Bennis, and then Rich Rodriguez hung him with a fly ball out, and then he got a base hit his last time up, but four for five wasn't good enough. He needed a four for four. Obviously, a five for five would have done it, too, but he gets the hits off the tough right-hander, Bennis, but couldn't handle the left-hander, Rick Rodriguez. Off-speed delivery. Free straight out of the strike zone for Martinez. He's really been working on Morris with changeups. He struck him out on a 3-1 change, 3-2 change his first time up, and he's been feeding him a pretty steady diet of off-speed pitches. A fastball down the middle, three balls and a strike. 1991 was the first full season of the majors for Al Morris after a very successful college career at the University of Michigan. His teammates there, well, his teammate now with the Reds, Barry Larkin, as well as Jim Abbott of the New York Yankees. Big difference since the All-Star break, but don't forget Morris missing the first two months of the season. Took a while to get his rhythm. So after a 3-0 count, it's now full to the leadoff man. Kevin Mitchell coming up next. U of M pretty well representative with, representative with Larkin Morris and, of course, Chris Sabo, the third baseman. Yes. Fly ball. Left center field. Butler going back. And he's got it just short of the wall. Pretty good chance at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. That'd been a home run. That is the real launching pad there. The ball just seems to carry. The fences are shorter, but Mitchell. Butler had just enough room. Brett Butler, 475 games, has had two errors. Brett Butler has gone 205 straight games with no errors. Butler's in his 10th year. He's never won a gold glove. And Brett says, well, I'm not going to lobby for it, but sometimes I wonder what the criteria is. <laughs> Kevin Mitchell looking for his first hit of the night. Broken bat bouncer for Corey Snyder. Two away. Ramon got in Kevin's kitchen, sought off the bat. Corey Snyder, Mr. Handyman, has played third. Has played right field. He has a terrific throwing arm. Martinez had a stretch. From the end of the second all the way into the fifth inning of seven in a row retired before it was broken up by a base hit by the pitcher Tom Browning. Now you set down three in a row as he's set to face Chris Sabo, as Dave mentioned, another former Wolverine for the University of Michigan and the National League Rookie of the Year in 1988. Hit the ball hard his first time. Right at the left fielder Eric Davis, the fastball to the knees, strike one. Popped out to the first baseman his last time up there. No walks for either pitcher tonight. Well, that was one of his problems coming in, but he has not had a problem tonight. Low and away, it's even at a ball and a strike. Martinez also tried to become the first Dodger pitcher to win nine games this year as he came in at eight and six. Another fastball. 
And the Dodger pitching staff once again this year after a setback last season. Outstanding. When you look at the National League pitching totals, they're third overall with a 3.56 earned run average. And Sabo went around for the final out of the inning. And the fourth strike out of the evening for Ramon Martinez as he sets him down one, two, three. And we go to the bottom of the sixth. Some of the youngsters enjoying it tonight in Southern California. A crowd of about 35,000 on hand. And the opener of the three games set between the Dodgers and the Cincinnati Reds. The Dodgers have taken the first three this year at home against Cincinnati. In fact, in eight of the last ten years, they have taken the season series at least at Dodgers Stadium against Cincinnati as Mike Piazza first ball swinging fouls it away for strike one just missed in his first at bat against Browning when he fly it out to the center fielder just short of the warning track not as good at, at bat in the fourth inning and it's even at a ball and a strike no walks a strikeout six hits for Tom Browning that was that good change up to Piazza he's throwing that a couple of times on one and one the other thing Tom's been able to do is with that easy motion he's been able to sneak the fastball in on the hands of the Dodger hitters. He's a fly ball pitcher and a lot of times they've gotten jammed tonight. Tries it again with Piazza. And he's gotten in on Karos a couple of times. The one guy who's hit the ball hard consistently all night has been Eric Davis. The 2 2 fouled off to the right side that should find the seats. Well, Mike Piazza has 21 home runs so far this season. It pays to bring that club. 21 home runs so far this season. That's only four shy of the L.A. Dodger record. It's held by Joe Ferguson back in 1973. Now the all-time rookie home run leaders for the Dodgers. You got to go all the way back to 1928. Del Bissonette with 25. Another one out of play off to the right side. It remains two balls and two strikes to the leadoff man in the bottom of the sixth inning. With the Reds leading the Dodgers one to nothing. Looks like Piazza will continue a tradition. There's really only been five regular catchers for the Dodger franchise over the last 45 years. The bouncer, Branson, the shortstop, made a great play just to get to it, but couldn't hand, hang on to it once he got it out of his glove. So a leadoff single for the Dodgers catcher. Snyder. So Mike was able to fight that one off. See him bring the arms in and hit it up the middle. He stumbled going out of the box. Had Branson been able to come up with a clean, but he just couldn't get a good grip on the baseball. And if he does come up with a clean, he's probably got Piazza because he does not move down the line all that well. Now can Corey Snyder come up with a base hit to move the man into scoring position or at least advance the runner the second base strike one Corey reaching safely both at bats one time on an error but the second baseman Juan Samuel the other a line drive single to right back in the second Dodgers have stranded seven runners over the first five innings And it's off the glove of the pitcher as it was going up the middle. Tough break for Snyder as that's the first out. So it goes 1 6 3 on the put out. Well, that's the second time tonight that Browning has really helped himself out. That hard hit ball, the liner by Davis, and now one by Snyder. Yeah, and Don Gullett, pitching coach, on his way out. You can see Browning just gets it up at the last second and hits the heel of the glove, and it looks like it might have bounced down off his toe. But Browning finishing up facing home plate has really helped his own cause. Don Gullett, great left-hander for the Reds, out to check in his pitcher immediately. And Browning says, hey, I'm okay. Not a bad lefty. Not at all. I mentioned Piazza, the Dodgers string of catchers, beginning with Campanella, then John Roseboro, then you went to Tom Haller, Steve Yeager, and Mike Socia. Over the last 45 years, the only other guys that have caught, one year it was Chris Canazero and another Joe Ferguson. But the rest of the time, those five men have manned that position. And Piazza looks like he may be in for a long run as the Dodger catcher. Raul Mondesi 
Has driven in two runs during his brief major league career that's been all of about three weeks now and takes ball one. And you'd have to think that has a lot to do with the exceptional pitching that's been going for the Dodgers for so many years now. That continuity behind the plate. Only had a couple of pitching coaches along the way, too. During that span, Red Adams and Ron Paranowski. Had the lead runner if he wanted him. Instead, takes the sure out. Mondesi. That is out number two. Well, he's got Jody Reed with the base open. I think they will probably walk Reed. I don't see any activity in the Dodger bullpen, and I don't think they'll take a chance on Jody Reed. I think they'd rather deal with Ramon Martinez. The perfect position displayed once again after delivering the ball by Tom Browning, as opposed to Ramon Martinez, who really falls off the mound towards first base, and that hole up the middle is wide open. Well, absolutely. I mean, a lot of pitchers have had very successful careers. Jim Bunning, Bob Gibson, with that totally uh, falling off the mound motion. Of course, Gibson was such a great athlete, he didn't necessarily get all the balls through the middle, but he was able to still get back and get bunts on the third base side. The intentional walk is going to break a string of 28 and two-thirds innings for Tom Browning without issuing a free pass. Well, no doubt the correct decision by David Johnson. Again, Ramon Martinez has turned around batting right-handed for whatever reason tonight. And Jody Reed, good contact hitter, tough to pitch to. You just don't want to take a chance, even with a veteran like Browning. And check that, actually 29 and two-thirds innings for Tom Browning. Well, Tuesday night, it's a doubleheader on ESPN. The Yankees and the Red Sox right now tied for second place behind the Blue Jays. Only two games out of first in the East. And then the Astros and the Padres looking at a lot of the young talent over the final eight weeks of the season. That's our Tuesday night doubleheader on ESPN, all starting at 7.30 Eastern. Ramon Martinez, 0 for 2. Browning in the fourth place, his first two at-bats. It's high and wide for ball one. And Martinez helped himself. He is only six for 52 on the season. He has driven in a couple of runs. Fouled off to the right side, a ball and a strike. It's a one to nothing lead for Browning and the Reds with two away in the bottom of the sixth. As the Dodgers have now hit the Reds seven to five. Eventful week for Tom Browning, as we discussed earlier, and now a very solid start. The opener of the three-game series. The ball just momentarily getting away from Joe Oliver, but not far enough for Piazza to advance. Two balls and a strike. So the tying run down at second, but the pitcher at the plate. It all started on the infield single by Piazza. He's the runner at second. And they got Snyder on the hard hit ball off Browning's glove. Yeah, and I think Browning may have decided that he cannot go any longer. He has called the pitching coach out, trainer going out, and evidently the hand where that ball hit, nicked him on the tip of the finger must be affecting him. By the way, you know, we allowed Dennis Munition to backtrack. We asked him if he'd seen Martinez bat right-handed. He said no. But we now find out that <laughs> Martinez hit a home run batting right-handed against Tom Glavin in 1991 just to keep you up to speed and it's right on the index of the middle finger and that's obviously you know a finger he needs especially on the screwball fastball so we will have a pitching change and of course the new pitcher will be allowed to take as many warm up pit tosses as he should choose so Tom Browning through for the evening after working the first five and two thirds and leaves still with a shutout on the board after giving up seven hits. So something developed on the middle finger of the pitching hand for Browning. Attention, please. Now pitching for the Reds. 59. Bobby. Bobby Ayala, the new pitcher, will look at his numbers while we're. A one to nothing lead for the Cincinnati Reds in the bottom of the sixth inning, but Tom Browning had to leave with a problem with the middle finger on his pitching hand, and it didn't appear that that pitching hand was affected when he was hit on the bouncer up the middle that went off. It looked like the heel of his glove hand. 
Ayala making his 32nd appearance very successful recently. He has only given up three hits in one run over his last nine and a third innings covering his last six appearances. And the opposition hitting only 209 off the right hander didn't need all that many warm up tosses as he's ready to go. Well you always wonder about that especially with youngsters they like to say they're ready sometimes they think they are but not necessarily. Davey Johnson talking to him before the ball game tonight says he really likes the makeup of this young right hander. I said were you projecting long term start or relief. He said relief. He said he comes in and blows hard for three or four innings. He's perfect in long relief. He may eventually be a closer but he's got the good mental makeup. He inherits a two and one count with two away. Ramon Martinez now moving over to the left side of the plate and bouncing it for Juan Samuel who gets the big hop for the final out of the inning. So all it took for Bobby Ayala was one pitch and he holds it down for the Reds after six. It stays the same. The Reds continue to cling to a one-run lead over the Los Angeles Dodgers. The difference of the game, Reggie Sanders. And I asked batting coach Ray Nye before the game tonight, what impresses him the most about the young right fielder? His work ethic. Um, uh, he's just a happy person. He smiles all the time. He makes you feel better when you're around him. Uh, he does everything well. He runs well, throws well. Uh, he hit 270 last year, right around 270 again. I think you'll eventually, when he learns the strike zone, gets a little more mature, be a 300 hitter, 25 home runs, and can steal 30 bases. You're talking about superstar type uh, potential. It's just a matter of uh, how quickly he develops. Our former colleague from ESPN, Ray Knight, enjoying himself in the Cincinnati Reds dugout, talking about Reggie Sanders, who will lead off the inning. And he is the difference with his 16th home run of the season. A new career best for him. He's driven in 60 runs. And the fastball catches the corner for strike one. Sanders, Oliver, and Samuel coming up for Cincinnati. Last year, Sanders started most of the time in center field, some in left field, so it's a new position for him. He's been positioned out in right field this year with Bobby Kelly coming over and starting the season up the middle in center field. Great looking athlete. Another fastball catching the outside edge 0 and 2. When he hit the home run. He went down to get a breaking ball over the outside portion of the plate. Now he inches up just a little bit closer to the plate. Ball in two strikes. The Dodgers about hit the red seven to five, but they've stranded nine over the first six. And he got him on the high hard one that could have been out of the strike zone for his fifth strikeout. As we head east with Chris Myers. Chris. Thank you very much, Joel. While Tony Gwynn tries for his 2,000th career hit, the Padres are playing the Colorado Rockies. The team making news. A report in Saturday's Washington Post newspaper says a group has reportedly offered $150 million to buy the Padres and move them to the Washington, D.C. area. Bart Fisher, a Washington attorney, told the Post this news, says he has not heard a response from San Diego owner Tom Werner, and Werner has officially not announced that the Padres are for sale. Uh, back in Los Angeles, Dave Campbell, a San Diego area resident, has some thoughts on the matter. Dave? Well, of course, the Padres of 1973 were headed to Washington until Ray Kroc stepped in and bought the club. Um, I think I need more details, but <laughs> the group's not real popular in San Diego right now. I'll let it go at that. In foul territory, will Eric Caros have a play on the foul ball? No. Off the bat of Joe Oliver, it remains 0-2. Well, when you talk about that ownership group, Tom Warner is the principal, but the other 13 or 14 minority interest owners are San Diego area residents. I, I think 11 or 12. Uh, Mr. Goldschmidt, is, uh, the second uh, highest owner in terms of percentage, also lives in the Los Angeles area, but the rest of them are San Diegans. Uh, no. I think San Diegans would be very pleased if Warner sold the club, but to move it, Mm -hmm. Ball in two strikes, and you'd have to think that the group from Tampa St. Pete that came so close 
acquiring the San Francisco Giants from the Bay Area would like to have some say in the bidding as well. Well, from what I've heard, they've been told to lay off. <laughs> no, I, I really have. For expansion? Yes. Wait. Don't be messing with the Padres. That is the third consecutive strikeout for Ramon Martinez. He has six on the evening, and he has now retired six in a row. Well, Ramon has gotten his second win because this ball has got some fur flying off at a high riser, and Bill Oliver can't catch up. It brings up second baseman Juan Samuel with two away, and the base is empty. 85 pitches. As Martinez works at the top of the seventh, the bouncer for the third baseman. And Corey Snyder guns down Juan Samuel. So seven in a row set down by Martinez. Seventh inning stretch time at Dodgers hitting with the Reds still on top by one. Ladies and gentlemen. ESPN's presentation of Major League Baseball is brought to you by Office Depot, taking care of business with guaranteed low prices on thousands of brand name office supplies. Magnificent night in Southern California. The temperature now in the low 70s as Bobby Ayala gets ready to work to the Dodgers at the bottom of the seventh inning. If you joined us a little bit late, in the sixth, Tom Browning, who not too long ago threw a perfect game against the Los Angeles Dodgers, had to leave early for Davey Johnson with a, it looked like a blister developing on the middle finger of his pitching hand. He had been scuffed up a little bit on a bouncer off the heel of his glove and the wrist earlier in the same inning. But that ball did not come close to his pitching hand. So now a young man who went to Rio Mesa High School just about an hour from here in Oxnard, California. Bobby Ayala finds himself on the hill at Dodger Stadium. What a throw that has to be for this young man. And the first one, ball one to the leadoff man, Brett Butler. One thing they have taken away from Brett Butler this year, the bunt. He has 17 bunt singles after 41 last year, but now every first third baseman in particular is always in the grass. And in this instance, both Morris and Sabo are in tight. Of course, that just allows Brett some more room to hit it by him. He likes to slap it uh, past Sabo. Once in a while, he'll get it past that first baseman. If he hits it down the first baseline, it's usually a triple because the outfield plays him swung way around. You see how close Sabo is. The lost part of Bunny still alive and well for Brett Butler. And it's one and two. Of course, Butler still feels no matter how close they play, if he lays down the perfect bunt, they're not going to get him. Yeah, throwing well in the early going tonight. He goes at 6'3", 200 pounds. 24-year-old. And the off-speed delivery. Chop foul. It remains a ball and two strikes. Top three in the batting order for the Dodgers. Butler, then Offerman, and Eric Davis. The Dodgers have not been able to hit tonight with men in scoring position as they have stranded nine over the first six. Sabo still not quite sure Butler's not going to bump with two strikes. Most guys go back behind the bag once Brett gets two, and that'll get him to first. Butler took it in the wallet. Like some kind of a funky breaking pitch. It got away from Ayala, and Brett Butler gets aboard. Brett would prefer the walk or the hit, but. He didn't know which way to go. Hit him right in the hip. He was twisting and turning, but that ball just had Brett's name written all over it. So Butler aboard for the second time this evening after picking up a base hit in the third. Now it's Jose Offerman. 24 steals in 38 attempts this year for Butler. Well, if Lasorda follows form, Offerman will probably bunt here. Jose, 14 sacrifices already. Tommy plays it pretty close to the vest most of the time. The bunt. It's a perfect one. The sacrifice going 1-3 on the putout. And the tying run in scoring position now. Well, Davis with a chance to do some damage against his former team. Of course, he didn't leave there under the best circumstances. Never was too pleased with Mrs. Shot after what he considered bad treatment following his injury in the 1990 World Series.
Davis, one for three. He's hit the ball hard all three times he's been up there. Eric Caro's on deck. And a tie and wide for ball one. Ayala, you can see he can bring it. And it's got to be a completely different mindset going to the plate now as opposed to the finesse pitcher that the Dodgers saw. Over the first six innings, Tom Browning. From the left-hander now to the right-hander in relief for Cincinnati. The Dodgers have been one of the more effective teams with men in scoring position so far this season. You can see the number at 288, third best in the National League, but 0 for 9 tonight. And 9 is the number that they've left on base as well. The 1-0. Two balls, no strikes to Davis. Butler, a very cagey runner. This is the situation where if you can get the great jump is where you want to try to steal third. One out, right-handed batter up. Brett stole third eight times a year ago, but he really hasn't taken a big lead against Ayala. But Bobby does have a high leg kick. Pop back here. It's two and one. Ayala. Forced the Dodgers to strand two in the last inning. So out of the inherited runners for Ayala this season. He is held, or at least stranded, 17 of the 21 that he has come on to face. I again three and one. Now that was a slider that just never broke. First base is open, but Eric Carros is coming up next. The 3 1. And Davis can't believe that was a call in the corner. As Eric Carros wakes on deck, Bobby Ayala, you could see talking to himself a little bit after that last pitch. Will it be the fastball or the slider? On three and two. Tying run Butler down at second. And the off-speed delivery gets Davis. Well, that's confidence from your catcher. That kind of call on the payoff pitch. Eric. Looks like a splitter action. I didn't really know he had that in his arsenal, but the way that ball went down, it looked like a split finger pitch. Also looks like the same pitch that he hit Butler with. Two away, the leadoff man still down at second, and time has been called. We're in the bottom of the seventh inning, one to nothing Cincinnati. So the Reds come in with a four-game winning streak. That is their second longest winning streak so far this season. Eric Caros, one for three. Base hit came in his first at bat against Browning. Line drive single to left. He also fly it out to the center fielder, put him on the warning track, and popped out to the right fielder. Ayala getting the off-speed pitch over. Will it be another off-speed delivery? The 0-1. Yes, nothing in two. Well, again, Davey Johnson talks about how much he likes this youngster's makeup. He says he's got a reliever's mentality. He just comes after you. He is only 24 from Oxnard, California. The 0-2, the fastball, short hop by Sabo, and the Reds are out of the inning. So the Dodgers strand another man in scoring position. They are 0 for 10 with men in scoring position this evening. So we'll be right back to Southern California. Bobby Ayala. Good view from behind home plate at Dodgers Stadium. Eighth inning, and the Cincinnati Reds get ready to hit with a one to nothing lead in the opener of the three games. And for the third consecutive game, very little offensive support for right-hander Ramon Martinez. Bobby Ayala after the first one for strike one. 0 for 9. 0 and 2. Martinez has now retired 16 of the last 17 he has faced. 
seven in a row to start the eighth inning. And consistently, even last inning, we had him at 94 miles per hour on the gun as it's a ball and two strikes to his counterpart. The last start from Martinez, he only gave up two runs to the Chicago Cubs in eight-plus innings. So left the game, a game that went 13 before the Dodgers finally beat the Cubs 7-2. to two. It's Lyon, but right at the shortstop Offerman for the first out of the eighth. And the start before that for Martinez gave up only one run on four hits in eight innings to the New York Mets. But the Dodgers were shut out in that contest. So some tough luck as you look at a very impressive line for Ramon Martinez. 17 of the last 18, six strikeouts, and has not walked a batter. are out at the top of the order. Center fielder Greg Tubbs. Base hit his first time up there. Also a stolen base. His second of his big league career. The breaking ball over the inside corner. Strike one. Tubbs one for three. Grounded into a fielder's choice his last time. And also bounced back to the pitcher. An opportunity for both managers to look at a number of youngsters like Tubbs. Raul Mondesi for the Dodgers. And that will continue over the next eight weeks for the Los Angeles Dodgers and Cincinnati Reds. Ball and a strike. One away. Base is empty. One run on five hits for the Reds. Two and one. Well, Tubbs feels good from the standpoint that he's pitcher Tom Browning survived the one area he made. Boy, when you're a rookie and you boot one, you just go, man, I hope that pitcher can pick me up. And Browning did. Lined into right. It'll be the second hit of the night for Greg Tubbs. So he goes basically to right center field. And there's a man aboard with one away. So yeah. they figure some kind of running Branson. game would take place here. Branson, a pretty good contact man, hit and run. Tubbs with a good speed. Maybe Johnson certainly would like to get some kind of insurance run. So we'll wait and see what happens. Branson looking for his first hit of the night. He has sacrificed five times so far this season. He'll be followed by first baseman Hal Morris. Martinez had his problems over the first couple of innings, but that has been it. In the second inning, he gave up the only run of the contest, the 16th home run of the season, the right fielder Reggie Sanders. Fouled away for strike one. Obviously very comfortable in the second spot in the batting order. Jeff Branson, Silas, Alabama. Ray Knight telling David Johnson, you the man. <laughs> I didn't know they were on the first tee. You my <laughs> man. <laughs> Ray was telling us before the game tonight that he's enjoying himself because there are a number of youngsters on this team. It took a while to develop that trust factor after coming in after the first 44 games of the season as the new hitting instructor for the Cincinnati Reds. But he really is enjoying it now. It's why. Even at a ball and a strike, all I wanted to talk about was his wife's golf swing. How can I pause up top that long and still get it done? Ray will take credit for that. <laughs> then on the other side, the leadoff hitters are hitting 236 combined. He doesn't want any part of that. He doesn't work with the leadoff hitters. The high hard one, a ball and two strikes. Six strikeouts so far for Ramon Martinez. Probably tells Jose Cardinal, the first base coach, hey, you were the great base stealer. You work with those leadoff hitters. I'll take those uh, number two, three, and four hitters. There's Jose. They really haven't had a constant from the leadoff spot, though, with all the injuries suffered by Bip Roberts this year. Somebody once asked me who was the greatest player I ever played against. I always tell them it was Jose Cardinal, and they go, why? I said, because every team he ever played for, he always went four for four against whatever <laughs> team I was playing for and stole three bases. I said, I could say Mays or Clemente or... You know, I played with Al Kaline, but the greatest player I ever played against was Jose Cardinal because whether he was with the Cardinals or the Cubs or whoever he was with, whenever he played against the team I was on, he had the greatest days of his career. 
One and two count on the hitter, Jeff Branson. Greg Tubbs, good speed. The runner held on by Caros, who draws the throw. And just to tag that Jose Cardinal story, he asked some of the players if they'd like to come out early for practice on their work on the bases. Nobody showed up. Jose has been upset with the way they've been handling themselves on the base pass. He said, finally, maybe I'm going to put high top shoes on. And I'll be one of them. Yeah, and wear an earring. Maybe and, they'll and, listen yes, to me then. And then they'll be out and join me. Driven into the gap. Butler moving over. He had him shaded in that direction, and that is out number two. Let's check in quickly with Chris Myers. Chris? All right, thanks, Joel. Miller, Genuine Draft, that's MGD, presents this date in baseball. 1972, Hank Aaron hit home runs number 660 and 661 for the Braves, setting the record for most home runs with a single franchise. And, of course, Henry Aaron went on to hit the all-time mark. Let's go back now to Dave Campbell and Joel Myers. And Chris can Hal Morris in the top of the eighth inning keep his eight-game hitting streak alive against Ramon Martinez. He is 0 for 3 so far this evening. He's only been able to get the ball out of the infield once on a fly ball to Brett Butler. Better than a 300 hitter in 26 at-bats against Martinez. Now will they think about moving Tubbs with two away? He's a runner over at first. He's already got a stolen base tonight. The first to Morris. I love the way he leans, almost leaps after it. Dave was talking earlier about the way he does move his feet. Well, he used to walk all over the batter's box, but when a guy hits 318 and just misses the batting title by a half point, you usually don't do too much. But he really does move his feet. Most hitting coaches talk about keeping the feet still. I know Mike Eastler does and reading the pitch, keeping quiet feet. But whatever works for Morris. The middle, the bouncer finds the hole. Tubbs takes the turn. He'll make it into third without a throw. Runners at the corners on the two out hit by Morris. Well, Hal keeps that hitting streak alive. And here comes Kevin Mitchell, who's been held pretty much in check tonight, but you only keep the big guy in check just so long. And Tommy Lasorda, as we take a look at Morris driving this ball back, Ramon, if he had stayed upright, he would have caught that. But when he followed through, he went down on his knees and then tried to get back up. Couldn't get to it. And you see Tubbs moving to third. That's the seventh hit of the night for Cincinnati. Hits identical now at seven apiece. Now the book on Mitchell, obviously, for the Dodgers, keep it in on his hands. Yeah, but you better have good stuff in there. He is 0 for 3. He's not been able to get the ball out of the infield. And he pops up the first one into shallow right field. Mondesi coming on. And the Dodgers and Martinez escape a two-on, two-out jam. We go to the last of the eight. Who's leading it off for the Dodgers? It'll be the leading candidate for Rookie of the Year in the National League, Mike Piazza. The Cincinnati Reds in the bottom of the eighth inning. Mike and a defensive Piazza. replacement coming Catcher. into the contest. Jacob Brumfield takes over in center field for... Greg Tubbs, who does stay in the game. Kevin Mitchell is gone. Tubbs moves over to left, and Mike Piazza leads it off for the Dodgers, looking at ball one. Probably Alice's job to get through the eighth. Rob Dibble is certainly ready down in that bullpen. Infield single for Piazza's last at bat as he goes deep to right field. Sanders going back. It's gone! Piazza is so special as he has the great power to all fields. You get it up and out over the plate, he can drive it deep the other way, as he just showed you. He can go straight away center. He has big time power. Short stride, compact swing. And it's his 22nd home run of the year to tie it up at one. So Ayala gives up the first run of the contest. As Corey Snyder, sharp two hopper for the shortstop. And Branson throws out the Dodgers' third baseman for the first out in the bottom of the eighth. Let's look back on the equalizer for Los Angeles. 
looked at first glance to be a fastball up and out over the plate. We'll get a second look. And it was a heater, and you notice how Piazza keeps the head right down. And he really generates some tremendous bat speed. He knew he had it. Reggie Sanders goes as far as he can, but runs out of real estate. And again, there's no cheapies at Dodger Stadium. Piazza hit that ball 380 feet. Dodgers are going to be sending up a pinch hitter. Mm -hmm. He had started off Piazza with a breaking ball that missed for ball one. And all of the success, basically, in the seventh inning when he worked out of a jam, Dave, came with the breaking stuff. He didn't challenge all that many hitters. He does have a good heater, though. He probably figured, hey, if I can get it out over the plate, if Piazza's good enough to hit it out the other way, my hat's off to him, and Mike did just that. Another good-looking youngster for the Dodgers, Henry Rodriguez. The pinch hitter for Raul Mondesi. Ball is swinging, strike one. Dodger bullpen is active. Ramon Martinez due after Jody Reed, who's on deck. Mike going, yeah, I hit that one on a pretty good piece of the bat. Owen oh, two. Jody Reed coming up next. There's one away in the bottom of the eighth. Henry Rodriguez has had an opportunity to play a lot recently for Los Angeles. Getting better than 350 over his last 35 at bats. Backs up from ball one. Well, that's that same pitch and hit Butler. It's the same one he struck out Davis on. It has split finger action. Not really split finger, more fork ball action. It's a crazy looking pitch. There it is again. Evens it up at two and two as a pinch hitter this year. Henry Rodriguez, four for ten with a home run. The 2 2 from the right hander. Ooh. Got to be agile. Got Kevin Gross's jacket on, but it's Tim Wallach. And Tim, who is just trying to get over a broken rib, didn't need to get nailed by that one. Can't fool us, Tim. You may have Gross's jacket on, but we know you are. Rodriguez after the high hard one. It remained two balls and two strikes. So a new ball game for the Los Angeles Dodgers and Ramon Martinez who's been phenomenal tonight. As his little brother Pedro gets ready in the pen. The breaking ball got him over the outside corner. That is the second strikeout for Ayala. Well, once again, this is that funky off-speed pitch. Looking to see if he's got some split in the finger. Doesn't appear to be. That could be a palm ball, but it's a great pitch on the outside corner. We'll go talk to the old left-hander Joe Nuxall in between innings and find out exactly what that delivery is. Jody Reed taking it low for ball one. Joe, of course, youngest man to ever play in the major leagues at age 15 former pitcher now broadcaster with the Cincinnati Reds that is always a lively booth for Reds fans Marty <laughs> Brenneman and Joe Nuxall <laughs> they all left hander rounding third and heading towards home Jody Reed with a little looper into left center and it drops in and gets past the center fielder Brumfield who just came into the contest the go ahead run in scoring position probably means we'll see Dave Hansen Brumfield was playing read around to right center. That's the value of positioning, but the pitch was an off-speed pitch, and Jody pulled it. One thing about it, if you're going to set your defense one way, don't necessarily pitch against the defense. You had Brumfield swung around to right center, so you better throw read fastball. If you throw him something off-speed, you're going to cross up your defense. Brumfield, long run, can't get there. Gets by, but a good backup by Greg Tubbs. That holds Reed at second base. So that'll bring on Dave Hansen and a decision now for manager Davey Johnson. Hansen 12 for 35 is a pinch hitter. Swinging the bat very well. Oh, I take it back. It's Mitch Webster. Well, Mitch Webster is a switch hitter. But you go to Webster who had 17 pinch hits a year ago. Or do you go after Brett Butler? I suspect maybe they go after Webster here. Six 
So Ramon Martinez through after working eight innings, giving up only one run on seven hits. And now, can Mitch Webster give him a two-to-one lead? The off-speed delivery for strike one. Pretty good move, I think, by Lasorda. He knows that eventually you're going to see Rob Dibble if the Reds have a lead. They're almost all right-handed except for Kevin Wickander. So by sending the switch hitter up here, and a guy maybe not quite as dangerous as Hanson, he knows that Webster is going to probably see some pitches to hit at here. Webster set a Dodger record last year, as Dave mentioned, with those 17 pinch hits, breaking the old Dodger record set by Manny Mota. The one and one. Two balls and a strike. The Dodgers 0 for 11 tonight with men in scoring position. Now can Webster help out the right-hander. Martinez can only watch. The bouncer out of the reach of the pitcher. Tough play for Branson. Not in time. Boy, terrific play by Branson. He did everything he could, but Webster got out of the box, and now there's going to be some pressure on the Reds' defense with Butler coming up. Because of the positioning, you never know. Brett might drop the bunt, so I'm sure Joe Malfitano is saying, hey, just be alive in case he does. Branson did everything he could. Ayala falling off the mound. Again, we talk about how important it is to field your position, but if your natural movement is to fall away, you're not going to be able to handle that ball. And Webster clearly beats it. Baby Johnson ready to make a pitching change. He is going to go to a left hand. We'll look at the new pitcher when we return. Runners at the corners now for the Dodgers with two away in the bottom of the eighth. It's even at one. The Dodgers trying to break the tie with a couple of board in the bottom of the eighth. Two away, though, and a left-hander takes over. Kevin Wickander. Quite earlier from the Cleveland Indians. One thing about Brett Butler, though, if you look at his career numbers, they are almost identical against left and right-handed pitching. The only thing I think is Brett has a little more propensity to bunt against the left-handers. Sabo in tight. Morris holding against the runner at first base. The first of Butler is high for ball one. Four sixty three average in these situations so far this season for Butler he is one for three tonight. He's also been aboard. He was hit by a pitch in his last at bat. And it's over the outside corner on the fastball. The ball and a strike. Wickander a native of Phoenix Arizona. Goes at 6'3", 200 pounds. The 1-1. One, one. Butler shoots it off to the left side out of play. A ball and two strikes. Well, David Johnson trying to find out something, not only for this year, but for next season. Wickander is only left-hander right now, so he push, pushes the button with Brett Butler standing in. Offerman, a switch hitter on deck, and then Eric Davis. Get the final out of the eighth. Butler shoots it foul again. Brett kind of threw his bat at that one. Stay alive. Tough man to strike out, though. Protecting the plate that last swing. That says whatever it takes to make contact. The one and two all over again, and he gets him on the high fastball. So Wickander accomplishes what he came in for, the strikeout of Butler with a go-ahead run only 90 feet away. But Piazza has tied it up with his 22nd home run of the year as we head to the ninth at Dodger Stadium. ESPN's presentation of Major League Baseball is brought to you by Miller Sharps. Miller Sharps gives you great beer taste anytime. And by Calcium Rich Tums. Tums helps wipe out heartburn and gives you calcium. Top of 
of the ninth inning on a beautiful Friday night in Southern California. Joel Myers, Dave Campbell, good to have you with us. For Friday night baseball on ESPN. It's the first of three between the Reds and the Dodgers. And Piazza has just tied it up for Los Angeles as Pedro Martinez, the 22-year-old brother of the starter tonight, Ramon Martinez, takes over. Extremely impressive arm. Great fastball, great changeup. Only two earned runs in his last 24 and a third, 0.74 during that span. Dodgers have found a gem. He is tied for the team lead in wins out of the bullpen at eight and two is Henry Rodriguez, the pinch hitter. Raul Mondesi replaces Mondesi now in right field. But what a fine Pedro Martinez has been for Tommy Lasorda. Worked yesterday, tossed two and a third. Only gave up one hit. Chris Sable will start it off for Cincinnati. Then it'll be Reggie Sanders and Joe Oliver. And a fastball for strike one. Martinez in 13 appearances in the month of July. Had 29 strikeouts in 21 innings. He was 3-0 with a 1.27 ERA as it's fouled back here. And quickly, 0-2 on Sabo. Chris Sabo, 0 for 3. His best at bat, his first one against Ramon Martinez when he hit the ball hard in the second inning, but a right at left fielder Eric Davis. His last two, he popped out at the first baseman and struck out back in the sixth. The one and two. And the fastball belted deep to center field. Butler going back. It's gone. And Cincinnati reclaims the lead. Power, great fastball hitter against a great fastball pitcher, and Sabo, who's been hot, drills a key homer for Cincinnati. Sabo's 14th came on a 94 mile per hour fastball. Not too many hitters are going to catch up with a fastball up in the zone with two strikes on him. But Sabo, a little bit above the belt, cranks it over the 395 sign. The fastball right past Reggie Sanders. Butler knew just how far he had to go. Gave it a great effort, but about three or four feet over the glove. Strike one count on the right fielder Sanders. First off speed delivery from Pedro Martinez. It's a ball and a strike. And Chris Sabo has been hot. At almost 350 in July, first week of August, better than 400. And the difference right now is it's lined into left. Davis moving towards the line. That is out number one. Joe Oliver. Pedro Martinez coming into the contest tonight. Opponents hitting only 178 off the right hander. The big guy is up and tossing in the uh, Reds bullpen. Rob Dibble. Dodgers have Offerman, Davis, Caro scheduled the first three with Piazza, the fourth hitter. Joe Oliver looking for his first hit. The one and out. Ball and a strike. Over the fourth home run given up by Pedro Martinez. Just about 75 innings of work. You can hear it pop up here, and it's two balls and a strike. Well, all three runs via the home runs tonight. Sanders and Sable for Cincinnati, Piazza for the Dodgers. A lot of men have been on base, but nobody's come around to score. Two and two. It's been pretty obvious to the Dodgers that they have an outstanding young right-hander in Pedro Martinez. He just needs to develop a solid breaking pitch. He's got the great fastball, the great change is working on the curve. We've seen him a couple of times this year when he's had a better than average curveball, but it's not a consistent pitch for him. But then again, his brother didn't have a good curveball tonight either, and he's been here for five years. But fastball changeup, a lot of pitchers can win with those two pitches if they can put them in the right spot. 
And the fastball right by Joe Oliver for the second out. You throw a 94 mile an hour fastball and about a 70 mi 79 mile, mile an hour change with great motion. One, you can win. Well. There's been a lot of pitchers that have done it. Mario Soto comes to mind. There were times when Mario Soto would go through a complete game and the only breaking balls he would even throw, slider or curveball, were just to show the hitter. Wouldn't even throw it close to the strike zone. Martinez averages better than a strikeout in any. Just recorded his first. And it's another fastball over the outside corner to Sam Well for strike one. So the Dodgers will get ready for Rob Dibble in the bottom of the ninth. Sam Well one for three. Couldn't hold up 0 and 2. And looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth inning. 2, 3, and 4 do up for Los Angeles. Offerman, Davis, and Carros each with at least one hit this evening. And if anybody can reach safely, then Mike Piazza. Mm. Now, don't forget Rob Dibble is coming on. Yeah, don't forget that, and don't forget both Pedro and Juan Samuel from the Dominican Republic. I'm sure Juan will probably have a few words for his countrymen when he sees him after the game. 96 miles an hour under the chin. So Samuel, in his early 30s, still showing those great reactions. <laughs> yeah, they get quicker <laughs> sometimes when that kind of gas is coming at your face. The one and two pop back here. Still a ball and two strikes. The Reds trying to make it a five game winning streak. Their longest of the season. Seven in a row. And how tough has it been this year for the Cincinnati Reds? Well they just moved percentage points ahead of the Houston Astros into fourth place in the National League's Western Division. The first time they have been in fourth that high since May 22nd. The one and two. Do it one more time. One of the more unusual stories on knockdowns I think I've ever heard Sam well and John Candelaria I don't know exactly which team it was recently they were playing an inner squad game and Candelaria hit Sam well and Sam well says what the heck are you doing he says that's for that grand slam you hit off me six years ago six years ago long memory a rare off speed pitch from Pedro and it's even at two and two with two away base is empty damage already done though for the Reds the lead off home run the 14th of the season third baseman Chris Savo and after an 0 and 2 start Sam well has worked it full play pitcher is due up next but the Reds have sent a pinch hitter out it looks like Tommy Gray in the on deck circle yes just recalled had a couple of excellent pinch hitting years with the Atlanta Braves acquired this past offseason by the Reds and just recalled from Indianapolis Samwell ready for the three two for Martinez and while you talk about the Atlanta Braves eight and a half games behind the first place San Francisco Giants do they have a run left in them. I don't know I thought uh, the games on August 4th when the Braves rallied from an 8 4 deficit to beat the Phillies and that same night the Giants blew a 7 1 lead against San Diego cut the lead to seven and a half after it looked like it was going to be nine and a half. I thought that might be key but then goes right back to eight and a half yesterday. And the breaking ball just barely outside. A two out walk to Sam Well, and you're talking about that contest where the Braves had a four to nothing lead for Greg Maddox and lost it to the Phillies 10 4. Yeah, Will Clark stepped up with a couple of home runs. Matt Williams with a three run shot yeah, yesterday in San Diego. The, the thrill has been on fire Manning. for the Giants. He has. It was funny. He had a, a long Manning. session with Tommy. hitting coach Bobby Bonds Ray. on Monday. Uh, I'm sorry on Tuesday in San Diego and that was the night he had six RBIs as we take a look at that pitch again and then bounced back with two home runs yesterday. That's a third rather lengthy session he's had with Bond since May 27th and each time it seems to have paid off. Tommy Gray. Outside corner he can't believe it. He looked back at the home plate umpire Wally Bell like you've got to be kidding me.
Tommy missed the first half of last year with a hand injury. Sends a fly ball in the direction of Brett Butler. And that is the final out in the Reds' ninth. But Chris Sabo coming through in the clutch for Cincinnati. His 14th home run of the year is the difference. So we go to the bottom half of the ninth inning with the Dodgers down by a run. Astros in San Francisco, fifth inning, Daryl Kyle with Robbie Thompson batting. Hits him on the elbow. He's taken to the hospital for x-rays, listed day-to-day -day at the moment. Matt Williams with three hits. Giants do lead at 4-1 on the eighth. If they hold on, they'll be up by nine and a half games over the Braves, who lost. Let's go back to Joel Myers and Dave Campbell in Los Angeles. Thanks, Chris. 2-1 lead for the Reds, thanks to Chris Sabo's ninth inning home run. And now the Dodgers sending up their two, three, and four hitters to face Rob Dibble. 15 saves so far this season for Dibble and 10 in his last 11 tries. Big guy certainly had some problems early. He had some eardrum problems. Uh, spring training coming out of the spring. Control was off. Then had the broken arm in Pittsburgh when Kevin Young slid into him at the plate. Just starting to get on track. But he can still have fits of wildness. The first one to the backstop for ball one. Offerman one for three with a sacrifice. That got a piece of the umpire, two and oh. Dibble has worked in 28 and a third innings, and he has given up 28 walks so far this season. Will he walk the leadoff, man? He's behind two and oh to Jose Offerman. And don't forget, if the Dodgers do get a base runner, the opportunity is there to bring Mike Piazza to the plate. 3-0. Very uncharacteristic of Rob Dibble. He hadn't been that way in the past, but Oliver wants to settle him down. Sports Center is coming up right after baseball from Southern California with Linda Lacone and Carl Ravitch. They'll be discussing the Mike Tyson appeal that was denied earlier today. NFL highlights. A great race going on right now in the American League Eastern Division as well as the Western Division of the American League. 3-0 to the leadoff man, Jose Offerman. Three balls and a strike. Dibble has already said this year that he's had to prepare differently in the bullpen because before when he got up, he knew he was coming into a game. That's been a different case so far this season with Davey Johnson, though. Three and two. So he said his preparation pattern has definitely changed with a new manager. The payoff pitch to the leadoff hitter, and it's ball four. The tying run is aboard. The 29th walk issued this season by Rob Dibble. Well, what do you do if you're Tom Lasorda? You got your three hitter up. Lasorda likes to bunt, but I got news for you. Eric Davis, not known as a bunter, and against a guy like Rob Dibble, Certainly not one of the easiest guys in baseball to bunt. One of the keys to being a good bunter is you have to put your nose across the plate. And from where Dibble comes, and as wild as he is, I don't know. Eric Davis may have asked for that meeting to say, hey, maybe if I talk to you, he'll throw me a fastball first pitch. Davis does not have a sacrifice this season. He doesn't have too many in his career, I guarantee you. One for four. Struck out his last time up there. Now is against right-hander Bobby Ayala. As Dibble is now the fourth pitcher of the evening. Squared around, pulled it back, ball one. He walked Offerman on a full count. First one to Davis out of the strike zone. There goes the runner, Offerman. The pitch, the throw, not close. Gutsy call by Lasorda. Well, Dibble with a high leg kick, very prone to the stolen base. 
Rob Dibble, one of the easier guys in baseball to steal off. He and Dennis Eckersley both have that real high leg kick, and you see Offerman about five strides into it. No chance for Oliver. I mean, a perfect throw still doesn't come close. 22nd steal of the season for Jose Offerman in 30 attempts. And now the tying run in scoring position. The Dodgers only one for 13 tonight with men in scoring position. By Hardman, right by Davis, one and two. Looked like Eric was trying to take a shot to the right side, but sometimes Dibble tough enough to hit without trying to do anything fancy. Bottom of the ninth inning at Dodger Stadium. Nobody down. The tying run at second. The one two to Davis. Two balls and two strikes. Ten saves in the last op 11 opportunities for Rob Dibble. Don't forget, he missed better than a month in that collision at home plate against the Pittsburgh Pirates with a fractured left forearm. The two and two. Right by Davis. The first out in the ninth. Well, it looked like Eric, even with two strikes on him, was still trying to shoot the ball to the right side to do his job. But Dibble, a very tough guy to exercise bat control with. You can see Davis is trying to shoot it out to right field. But Rob Dibble's a tough hombre to place the ball with, tough enough just to make contact. It brings up Eric Karos. It's wide for ball one. 33 strikeouts now for Rob Dibble after picking up his first this evening in 28 and two thirds. Now that sounds impressive, but it's nowhere near his norm. He's averaged almost 13 strikeouts every nine innings his career, which is the all time major league record. So he's below that statistic this year. Carroll's had a base hit, a line drive single. His first trip up there against Tom Browning. Over three since, though. David Johnson wants to go out and talk with Dibble. I think maybe he wants to talk about concentrating the hitter. But the other side of the coin, Offerman, like Butler, stole third base eight times last year. And if you don't pay attention to him with that high leg kick, it's like a, an automatic gift. So David Johnson talking to Branson. Dibble he could be saying, hey, let's not give this guy the bag. Or he could be telling Dibble to concentrate on the hitter. Well, and Offerman picking up that stolen base is 22nd of the season. He had a phenomenal jump against Dibble. They're worried about that walking lead from second. So now it's a little cat and mouse game with the middle infielders and Offerman in scoring position. And they help Dibble enough to keep him close. The Dodgers about hit the Reds 10 to 8, but are trailing the difference. A home run by Chris Sable in the top of the ninth. He's looking for his first lifetime hit. Four previous at bats against Dibble. The fastball belted deep to left center field. Brumfield going back. It's gone. number 13 in the home run department for Eric Karros. One of the things Dibble has not been able to do as effectively is get that devastating breaking ball over and I don't know if he doesn't have confidence where he's going to throw it to the backstop but he got a fastball up to Eric Karros and Karros who had been in a slump until yesterday did not miss it. Runs in consecutive games now for last year's National League Rookie of the Year. And you can see Tommy telling Eric Carros, get out there, take a curtain call. Well, all runs tonight scored via the home run. That's the only one with a man on, and it was the game winner. It's a fastball, inner half, up, and Carros smoked it. 
So despite the fact the Dodgers only won 14 with men in scoring position before that at bat, Garros came through. Seven runners left on base. Winning pitcher, Pedro Martinez. So the Dodgers in the first game of a homestand, 10 game homestand, it sees the Rockies and Padres come in, get a big win to start the homestand successfully. And the Dodgers now 4 0 at home against Cincinnati this year. A 3 2 victory tonight. Sunday night baseball on ESPN. The Blue Jays hosting the Milwaukee Brewers. For Dave Campbell and our entire ESPN crew, I'm Joel Myers. Thank you for joining us. The Dodgers defeat the Reds in dramatic fashion. Don't go anywhere, though. Sports Center is coming up next.